How are you this morning? Uh, the little video uh, is telling you to believe, but it's believe based on the evidence uh, of the scriptures that are based in sound grammar, sound archaeology. Ar- ar- uh, we have all the evidences to substantiate the text that which we have, and uh, it's a belief uh, that's not Kierkegaardian floating around the middle of nowhere with no evidence, and we thank God for that. It's good to be back. I was in California for two weeks. Just saying. <laughs> L.A., baby, you know, <laughs> Italy, that's, what, that's where I grew up, um, had to check out God's team, you know, uh, and it was miraculous last night if you watched the game, did you see it? You didn't see it? Okay, a church is all about conversion, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was a miracle in the ninth inning, five runs, they beat the Astros, it's now two to two, so be in prayer for my team, you know. If your team is the Angels, I don't know. I just, you know, I got issues. Uh, but anyway, so we had fun. Uh, here's what we were doing. I'll show you a little picture of the grandchildren. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the twins are now uh, four and a half. That's Olivia and Harper. And Hudson, uh, he's uh, three months. A uh, little boy. Uh, and he was being dedicated at church uh, where my son-in-law, uh, Greg, works. Uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun uh, just going to church and seeing his dedication. And then we did what all Californians do when you're in the state the night before we left. We went out for our favorite Mexican food restaurant. So uh, just saying. How many are here from California so I can identify with you? Praise God. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's three. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we had a lot of fun. Uh, I painted my daughter's house, fixed all the drywall or the outside. Uh, they had, their new home had a, had a, what do they call it, dry rot. Spent a week and a half doing that, fixing the stucco. Then we painted, and I took a doctoral class on systematic philosophy. <laughs> that was exciting. And I wrote the next to the last chapter of my dissertation as a transgenderism Friday. Yeah, yeah. Um, so tomorrow I just have to do some mop-up stuff, uh, and, uh, and I need to send it in this week, and then I'm going to be defending it uh, at Dr. Geisler's uh, seminary, Southern Evangelical, at the end of the month. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. Um, and so it's about, I think it's about 430 pages. Uh, we'll eventually make it available to you. Yeah. Yeah, the, what, you want the 30-page format, 50, <laughs> if, kind of pick, whatever you want, you know. You want, the, you want the, big, the big book. Okay. How many would want it if I, if I actually go to the, how many think about it? Okay, all right. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll produce it because we produce all the other books, and so we'll produce that. Uh, And I finished my doctorate in apologetics in April, so that'd be fun. I'm finishing a year early, so which is basically about a year. I finished the dissertation a year early, so uh, it's it's free time. I'm not even going to know what to do with it. It's going to be totally (laughs) cool. Uh, What book are we studying? Oh, by the way, I have to tell you something funny. Something somebody said the other night. I was at somebody's house for dinner, and they were introducing me to a new couple that didn't, you know, know who I was. And they're like, "Hi, this is our pastor, and he he got his he's he's getting his doctorate in transgenderism." I'm like, <laughs> mm, "No, yeah." They're like, "Back away, honey. Back away." You know, uh, no, that's not. <laughs> you believe that? Is that true, Chris? Is that true? It's not true. It's apologetics. Anyway. Yeah, it's a good story. Yeah. yeah. Why are we here? We're here to hear Marty talk about stories. No. Uh, we're here to study the book of Romans in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Uh, what chapter are we in? One. What verse? One. How long are we going to be in verse one? A long time. Yeah. Somebody asked me the other day when I got back from California, they're like, wow, I've missed a couple weeks. Have I missed anything? No. <laughs> We go slow. <laughs> so today we're going to cover uh, uh, verse 1b. <laughs> and I'm not kidding, in verse 2. Uh, we probably need to pray, don't we? Yeah, yeah I'm thinking we do. Uh, God, we pause to give you thanks. And we thank you that you're here. We don't have to ask you to be here. Uh, I think of uh, just the last little video that we watched and the songs that we've uh, sung ascribing greatness unto you. Uh, I think Thomas Aquinas was correct in his five ways to prove the existence of God. Uh, His third way, dealing with uh, gradations of things, could not even be uh, formalized in thought if we were just here by chance. We have to have an absolute reference point, and uh, that's you. Uh, You are the ultimate reference point, and that's why we can have good, better, best, and most excellent. Uh, That tells us a lot about you. Thank you for who you are. May we uh, see you on the pages of Scripture today. Speak to us individually. 
challenge, convict, console, do all that you do, accomplish your purpose in Christ's name, amen. Uh, when I was flying back uh, from uh, uh, California in the summer after my uh, grandson uh, Hudson was born, um, Liz and I flew from Sacramento to Burbank, then Burbank to um, uh, Dallas, Dallas to then um, uh, IED. And so when we were flying from Burbank, uh, which we've done many times, but you're flying from Burbank, and, if, and we're flying over, you know, all the Southwest, and, you know, I'm from Southern California near Yuma, El, C- El Centro is where I was born and raised for 20 years. So I was born on the border, raised there. So I, I, I get the desert, and I know what the topography looks like. I know the Salton Sea when you fly over and stuff like that. And in the desert, everything kind of looks the same, all the arroyos and everything. So we're flying along, and I'm looking out the window, and, um, and, I, and I leaned over, and I told Liz, I said, you know, hey, you know, I, think, I think we're flying in a circle, because it looks like the same kind of canyons I've been looking at, you know, over New Mexico for quite a while. And pretty soon the pilot came on and he goes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're flying in a circular pattern. I knew it. I'm not even a pilot. And um, so uh, he said, uh, there's a storm in Dallas. We can't land there. We're trying to burn up some fuel. Bad thing to tell the people on the plane. One lady freaked out next to me. We're going to crash. You know, no, we're not going to crash. Uh, and so we flew around in a circle. And then, and then he came on. He said, uh, uh, we're cleared to go to, t- to Dallas now. So we're going to fly straight again. So we did. And then after a while, I'm looking out the window going, Man, that topography looks the same. And then he came back on and said, uh, we're flying in a circular pattern. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, we, we flew in for almost three hours in a circle. And the girl sitting next to me was scared to death to be on a plane. Yeah, 30-something-year-old, single girl. Her business is to fly around to big, like, Fortune 500-type companies and train them how to organize their structure for staffing. So, you know, when I found out she was afraid to fly... Uh, I just started talking a lot to her uh, and, and trying to take her mind off the fact that we're going around in a circle burning up fuel. Uh, and so we just started talking. She found out who I was, what I did for a living, where I lived, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so after a while of talking the entire way, we, we, we finally landed in, in Lubbock, Texas. Whoa. We were the only plane. Yeah, it was unbelievable. We landed there to wait for the storm to go by and everything. So, so I got to know that young lady very well. So at one point she told me, she said, hey, you need to, you need to talk to my mom and my dad. They're, they seem a lot like you. I'm like, oh, oh okay. Uh, and she said, my mom runs this uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, and she told me the organization uh, for, you know, Dr. Lilbeck. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't know who that is. And uh, she goes, well, you know, he's the, he's the president of Westminster Theological Seminary. I'm like, oh. It was by chance that she sat next to me, you know, providential, is it not? And so, and so you know, I'm like, uh, Dr. Littlebeck, you know, president of Westminster. I went to Dallas Theological Westminster. Oh, okay. And um, so we just began to start talking about that. And so she said, well, I, I need to hook you up with Dr. Littlebeck because you share a lot in common as, as an educator and as a pastor. Uh, and you, you need to get to know each other, so I'll hook you up. And you're talking to somebody on a plane, you're thinking to yourself, what? Yeah, Right. <laughs> Yeah, uh-huh, like that. So we exchanged email addresses. I mean, the next day, she emails me, great talking to you. Uh, and here's my mom's email. Her mom then emails me. Then Dr. Lilbeck calls me. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so we're talking. He tells me, I went to Dallas Theological in the 70s before you got there in the early 80s. We had that in common. He's, he's like, I'm more Calvinistic in my theology. Uh, and so I, I went to Westminster to get my PhD there. And so we're talking, you know, as, as two Dallas grads uh, about uh, shop. And so then I, after getting to know him after a while, I said, hey, well, how would you like to just come down here and preach? Wow. Did, you remember when he came? Yeah. That's how he got here. <laughs> On a plane. Do you think things can just arbitrarily happen in your life for no reason whatsoever? No. Is it, here's another question. Do you think I would let just anybody come preach? I was on a plane. I met this guy wearing this hat from L.A., you know. <laughs> and, and I told him, hey, would you just like to come preach? You seem cool. Would I do that? No, no, I would not do that. So I found out, you know, okay, he's a, he's a, he's a Christian, Dr. Lilbeck. He went to Dallas Seminary. Check. Uh, he's going to heaven. Yeah, he knows good doctrine. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can have him come speak. And so he did. Did an awesome job. Yeah, and we'll have him back. Uh, he's having me come up there, by the way, to speak to 90 pastors on transgenderism. Presbyterian pastors. Because he told me, we are not addressing the culture. And he goes, on my watch, that's changing. But that's a whole other sermon. What's this got to do with my sermon? Like, Marty's rambling. No, I'm not. It, it has a point. I had to get Dr. Littlebuck's credentials, right? Because I'm not going to let anybody just come talk to my sheep. 
And, and, and so I had to get the background on him. This is what Paul's doing with the Roman church, isn't it? He's never been there. He wants to go to Rome, wants to go to Italy, doesn't want to go for a vacation, spiritual pilgrimage, wants to go there to the church. So he gives them his credentials in these opening verses. Uh, and then he tells them what he's going to talk about when he gets there. That's the rest of the verses of the whole book. His credentials. What were his credentials? Let's review. We covered two of them so far. Remember, three weeks ago? Are you different people? Or? Yeah, three weeks ago. Credential number one. Paul, a, a, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, right? Paul, he's a servant. Uh, and by the way, if you're sitting here thinking, hey, these are Paul's credentials to some ancient church. It doesn't apply to me. I'm checking out. I'm thinking about the next Dodger game or something. Uh, no, this applies to you if you're Christian. Because what he's going to talk about, uh, these concepts apply to you just as a Christian. Because should not Christians be servants? Amen. Absolutely. Sold out to who? <laughs> Jesus. You know? So it leads to a whole host of questions. Is there enough evidence in my life to convict me of being a servant of Jesus? Well, I just, I'm under the wire, man. No one knows I'm a believer. I'm just low. No. You're a bond of Christ. You should serve other people, not serve yourself. Paul says, that's the kind of saint I am. I'm not coming to your church to make a name for myself. I'm not coming because I'm famous. I'm just a servant of Jesus. And then he says, I'm also a what? An apostle. Apostolos in Greek. He's, a, he's an apostle, which in the base form of the word means, it's a, it's a political term, which means to be sent on a mission. So no one qualifies to be an apostle anymore for all reasons stated in my last sermon, one of them being Jesus had to see you face to face and appoint you. There just rules out apostles. But is the word apostolos still applicable today in the form of I'm sent on a mission from God? Like the Blues Brothers. It's fictitious. Yeah, I don't know about that either. You know, they, they said they were on a mission from God, but they weren't really on a mission from God. Paul was, he's sent on a mission from God. And he's going to talk to them if he comes about the mission that God sent him on. But he's going to disclose a little bit of that. But for us, it leads to to the question of, number one, am I a believer in who Jesus is as the Christ? And if I am, he's sending me. Where is he sending me? Who's he sending me to? It could be the girl sitting next to you on the plane who's gripping the arms of the plane telling you, I'm scared to death to fly, but I do it for a living. I mean... You know, what do you get on a plane for? Hey, I'm just there for a siesta. I'm going to kick back, relax, and just, you know. I don't want to talk to them. If eternity's in the balance, wouldn't you want to? See, what I found works really well for me, since I ma- mastered in Hebrew, I usually take my iPad, I, I, I flip it onto my Hebrew Torah, you know, like Exodus or something, and I just have the whole screen filled with Hebrew, and I just, I'm reading my Old Testament. Invariably, the person sitting next to you, it could be the most hardened skeptic in all of the world. They will look at you and go, Hey, uh, what's going on over there? You know, what are you doing? It's simple. Uh, I'm reading the Old Testament. Huh? Like, what's the language? Hebrew. Why'd you learn that? Well, I wanted to see if anything was lost in translation. Because you know how people say, you can't trust the Bible. Stuff's lost in translation. Trust me, conversation goes from there. It takes up the whole flight. Next thing you know, you're introducing them to Jesus. You know? <laughs> so whatever your method is, <laughs> you should be thinking about the person in the play next to you. Because God has sent you as an apostle on a mission, Right? Right? Yeah. Right. And what's his third credential? Third credential. Verse 1, B. Paul, bond servant in Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Next clause. Could we see the verse, by the way? Set apart for the gospel of God. Now, I threw some, So the first word up there is palos, you know, doulos, Christu, Jesu, kletos, apostolos, blah, blah, blah. So we get to the last clause, set apart for the gospel of God. That's what we're going to look at. Now, if we could go back to the last slide, this is what uh, Paul is telling you that he's going to do in his third credential. It's, it's Paul, not the servant, not the, what's the second one? Not an apostle. Now it's Paul, the purveyor. What's a purveyor? Not a surveyor. Purveyor. I purvey something. He's going to purvey the gospel to them. That's what I do. This is what he says he's going to do. He, this is what he talks about. He says, if I come, I am a purveyor. Why do we know that? Let's go to the verse. Let's actually look at the verse. He says, uh, I am called an apostle, and I am set apart for the gospel of God. That's what I am set apart to do, purvey the gospel message. Now, this is most interesting. And, and at our church, we study grammar because, well, why do we study grammar? Anyway, it matters. It is the best. It, it matters because the Bible is every jot and tittle, every stroke of a pen for, for a letter T that makes it a T. Uh, every dot of an I is the inspired word of God, especially in the original text. I mean, it's awesome. So we study the grammar because God inspired the grammar. He specifically chose Greek and Hebrew to be specific in what he wants to say. So when he says, I'm set apart, you must ask yourself, what verb did he use? Well, he uses the Greek verb aphorizo. Aphorizo is... 
is a term for setting apart boundaries. He says, I'm set apart like somebody setting stakes on a piece of property to show you the boundaries. You know, I first moved out here and I had no fence. In California, everyone has a fence. Why? Liz and I come here looking at homes. These lawns all bleed together. This is freaking me out. I, I mean, I got to have my space. First thing I did, called the county, had to come out, stake out my yard. And I'm a former landscaper. I built a fence around my place. All my neighbors are like, what is your problem? You know, I'm from California, you know, I don't want you coming over when I'm grilling, you know, I mean, it's my, I'm just saying, be nice on a plane, coming to grilling, different thing, you know, uh, alfarizzo, set apart something, cordon it off. So Paul says, when I look at my life, yeah, it's like alfarizzo, it's cordoned off for a purpose. This is my space. Who cordoned it off for him? God did. He didn't cordon it off because he thought he was saved, remember? If you asked him. Uh, when did this cordoning off occur, Paul? Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. What does it say? He, he testifies, but, but, but when he, uh, God, has set me apart, off a rizzo, same word, uh, even from when? Uh, from my mother's womb. And, and when? Well, he called me through his grace. Uh, he was pleased when he did this. When did God call Paul? I know when he called me. I mean, it was in 1967 in September, back then. I, I can tell you the day and everything. Uh, but when did God call Paul? When did he really? What does he say here? From my mother's womb. I mean, your dad ever tell you, you know, hey, son, when you were twinkling in your, what? Mother's eye. I mean, what does that mean? You know, I'm one of those, uh-huh. You know, I mean, yeah. This is Paul telling you, hey, when God called me and set me apart, it was... It was from the womb he called me. Now, he throws this in because he's Semitic, he's Jewish, and this is a prophetic utterance, basically. He's telling you, I, I associate with the Old Testament prophets. Notice uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, who has not a positive negative for his, a nation, a word for his nation that's going to be taken away into captivity in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. He's the prophet to the nation to repent before God judges them. And he's the weeping prophet because no one will listen to him. Notice how God calls him. It's kind of Pauline in nature. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Huh? And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you to be a prophet to the nations, the Jewish nation first, and the Goyim, the Gentiles, as well. Really? When did he call Jeremiah? In the womb and before. Before. What's this tell you about God? Well, many things. He's omniscient. So he's outside his time and space. He's outside cause effect. He's outside our dimensionality and all the limitations thereof. He knows all things. Everything about his person, his omniscience, his omnipotence, everything about him is in perfect balance. One's not greater than another. He's perfection. His knowledge is perfect. He says, when I who see all things from my vantage point outside of your dimensionality, etc., I look down the halls of time. I see a guy named Paulos. I'm going to save him. I'm going to redeem him. He doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to call him. And I, I did the same thing with Jeremiah. What's this tell you about God? He has a plan. And if you struggle with low self-esteem, you should walk out of here feeling good. Because God loves you enough to say, I had a plan about you before your parents even were dating. It's a spiritual plan. Are you paying attention? I'm trying, I'm knocking on your door. Are you listening to me? I have a plan. Back to my sermon. He says, uh, I'm, I'm kind of like that. He said, I thought I, thought I I thought I was saved. I thought I had a plan, but God had a plan way bigger than my plan. Now, Paul was, uh, what was his job occupation prior to becoming a Christian? <laughs> Tent maker, okay? He made tents, all right? So every pastoral type person has to have a side job doing something. So mine would be landscaping. landscaping. Yeah, I even had somebody send me a landscaping question on vacation in, in Sacramento. They said, hi, it's so-and-so. We know you're on vacation. Sorry to bother you. We have a desperate problem in our yard. Could you help us? <laughs> and I did. I, I, I helped them. Yeah, I mean, spiritual issues, you know, lawn issues. I, you know, hey, I took some uh, <laughs> weed management, you know, from UC Davis. I took a class one day. Uh, you know, hey, I want to help you. But, but so I'm just following Paul. But, but Paul's telling you, I, I was a Pharisee. Boy, was I. So I want to show you the difference between a Pharisee and a Sadducee. Okay, a Pharisee. They, they were called, uh, in the Hebrew, they were called the perushim. What does that mean? Oh, it means to be the separated one. Is that what they called themselves? Nope. What they called themselves? Chasadim, the pious. 
could you imagine if you asked me, like, hey, who are you? Hey, I'm, I'm Marty. And, uh, like, how do, you class, you know, how do you describe yourself? I am called the pious one. <laughs> You're laughing, why? We're switching churches, honey. Yeah, right. I was at the bank one day when I was new, uh, and um, the a little teller, she's, you know, like, who are you? I see your driver's license is, you know, from California, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, what do you do? You know, I'm a pastor, you know. Uh, oh, you are? You know, what should I call you? I'm like, uh, I don't know, your holiness? <laughs> <laughs> she, she starts laughing at She didn't even know me. She starts laughing in my face. I'm like, just kidding. It's Marty humor. Just kidding. You know, just kidding. You know, uh, Paul says, yeah, I was a Pharisee, and we called ourselves the what? The Hasidim. Who called us the separated ones, the Perishim? Our enemies, the Sadducees. So we got back at them because they called themselves the Sadakim. So if you take off the letter T in Hebrew, uh, it, it is Sadakim. Sadiq in Hebrew means to be righteous, like the righteous brothers. Remember them? Lost that love and feeling. Anyway, back to my sermon. Sadakim, the righteous ones. But the Pharisees didn't like them, so they said, we're going to play with your name. You call yourselves the Sadakim, we're going to change the vowel pointing. We're going to call you the Sadukim, the desolated ones. <laughs> wow. Paul said, I was one of those guys that called those other guys the Sadukim. And he said, I embraced the notion that they called me the Perushim because, hey, if anybody was going to heaven, we were because we really were the pious. Because who was more devoted to the Mishnaic oral law than us? I mean, who was more devoted to the Mosaic law than us? I was going to heaven based on my works. Coupled with faith in God, of course. But, you know, I was going to get in based on my performance. Well, then he ran into who? Jesus. <laughs> Who's basically to tell him, Paul, you're on the wrong road. You're on the wrong road. You're not on the road that leads to life. Let me, let me choose you and call you and cordon you off and send you on a mission. That's the true mission. See, when you run into Jesus uh, and find the evidence of who he is, his person and work, and you embrace that faith based on the evidence, changes everything about your life. You who thought you were saved, well, he completely changes things for you to under, help you understand, now you were never saved. You were saved based on your own performance, which doesn't get a person into heaven. Because really all God wants to know is, do you believe in the person and work of my son? His work matters. Paul said, I was, I was completely lost. Alpharizo is also an e interesting word just from a grammatical perspective. It is called a perfect passive participle. Don't you love participles? Perfect passive participle. What in the world has that got to do with anything? Everything. Uh, the, uh, the perfect tense. Uh, according to uh, Daniel Wallace and his Greek grammar, Beyond the Basics, and he's who I learned Greek from at Dallas Seminary when he was a PhD student, um, he uh, would classify this as an intensive use of the perfect, meaning intensive, meaning when God cordoned off Paul, it wasn't for, hey, Paul, I, I got a two-week mission here for you to do. No, he says, when I called you to be my saint, it's for a lifetime of following me. Lifetime. That's the perfect, past act, biting the result. It's also passive tense. What's that mean? It means the subject is being acted on by an outside force. What's that mean? Paul, the subject, is being acted on by God, who comes down into his dimension and says, let me show you my kavod, my glory. And let me show you my glory, Paul, and ask you, I am the resurrected one. Why are you kicking against the goads? Why are you killing my people? He became a believer that day. See, God got his attention, and Paul said, he separated me. It was his idea, not my idea. What was he set apart for? He tells you that if you follow the grammar. He says, I was set apart for the gospel. Whose gospel? The gospel of God. The gospel of God. For the gospel, the little preposition um, gives the purpose of his separation for the gospel of God. We want to look at that uh, gospel because there are many gospels in our world that are false. There's only one gospel that's true. All gospels that deny personal work of Jesus Christ do not lead to, to his heaven. And so we want to focus on two things. Number one, the person of that gospel message is the first thing we want to look at. Man's gospel is pretty simple. Belief in God, whoever he may be, and then performance to get into God's presence. That's, that's man's way. Faith plus works. Uh, this is the uh, 500th anniversary of Martin Luther. What'd he do? He nailed his 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg and told the church, you have forgotten sola fide, grace. You've forgotten salvation by grace. And started the, the revolution, which became the Protestant uh, movement, which is who we are, Protestants. What did we protest? Salvation by faith plus works. Martin Luther came along and said, no, you're saved by what? Grace and faith alone, nothing else.
And so Paul comes along and says, man's gospel is pretty simple. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, kind of tells you man's gospel, how it's put together. It says, the heart, Jeremiah says to his nation, uh, as he watches it slide into the moral abyss, the heart is more deceitful, deceitful than all else and desperately sick. I think the King James reads wicked. He says, who can understand it? I mean, isn't, isn't this something that you say to yourself constantly as you're reading the don't you say this stuff? When you're watching the news and you're seeing this shooting, that shooting, this person's become perverted. I mean, I'm out in California thinking, is everybody a pervert? I'm serious. Watching the news. I mean, who is a person of upstanding moral quality anymore? And then you read it, Jeremiah, and what's he say? You can't even figure out the depths of people's evil, such as my culture I live in. But see, God specializes in a gospel that redeems even a wicked heart. See, he pursues that person. Wicked. Now, when I was uh, younger, and, and there, some of them were still alive, on my mom's side of the family are Jehovah's Witnesses. So it makes for interesting family get-togethers. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just like a stated rule. You know, we don't dive into heavy theological discussions with Marty around. Uh, why? I'll tell him the truth. I'll just tell him the truth, you know? Because our two systems of theology are diametrically opposed to one another. Because what do they believe about Jesus? Well, he's not God. He's a God. I believe he is the God. Big difference. Uh, when it comes to salvation, we're light years apart. Because they believe, well, you've got to believe in God, their version of God, which is watered down from who God is, uh, and works. Well, how do I know that? Well, I've read Charles Taz Russell. Here's what Charles Taz Russell says about salvation. He's their founder. Uh, unbelievers must be uh, recovered from blindness as well as from death that they, each for himself, they, th that they might have a full chance to prove by obedience or disobedience their worthiness of life eternal. You want to get saved in that theological system? Guess what? It's a treadmill. And you're constantly running on it. And when you finally get to what you think is the end of it, no, no, there's more works to do. I am so glad I'm saved by what? Grace. Grace. Jesus did all the work. So when we look at the, the gospel message, God's, God's message is his message. He owns it. It's the genitive possession. It's the gospel of God, genitive possession. He owns it. Paul says, it's not my gospel, it's his, and it's bathed in grace. It's his gospel. Why did he use the word gospel anyway? Well, that's just, you know, what you do when you're sharing. You share the good news of Jesus. But to a Roman, you really had to use the word gospel. Why? Because in the Roman mindset, the word gospel didn't mean the good news of Jesus Christ. Their culture, the word gospel meant the good news of the emperor worship. Uh-huh. That's why he wrote it at the beginning of his credentials to say, you guys think the gospel is invol involves the good news of emperor worship? I got news for you. It's the gospel of the living God, and it's not the emperor. See, amazing. The, the, the promise of the message, what did, what's the promise of that message of that gospel? Well, that's, that's verse two. We are now moving to verse two. I'm just saying, hallelujah. Verse two. What's verse two say? Well, which he, God, promised this gospel. He promised when? Beforehand. Like what beforehand? Uh, and who did he give us a promise through? Through the means. Came through his prophets. Which ones? Well, the ones, you know, in the Holy Scriptures. What are those? Well, if the canon's not closed, which it wasn't in his day and time, what are the Holy Scriptures? The Old Testament. The Torah and the Nebaim. So the Torah and the prophets. So the law and the prophets. Which is Genesis through Malachi. It's the whole Old Testament. What's he say? God gave us this gospel, his gospel of the coming of the Messiah to be our Savior and Redeemer, to save us from sin. He gave that to us through the prophets in the Old Testament. He did? It's all over the place. It's all over the place. Uh, that word uh, promised beforehand is a, is, a, um, is a combination of two words. It's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a verbal concept wedded to a preposition. The, the word pro is the word uh, for the preposition, the first three letters. The first... That first looks like an O with a dot. That's, that's the word which. Well, the next word uh, is the word for promised beforehand. The first three letters with the pi, uh, that, those first three letters, that's a preposition, pro. Uh, it, when you wed a preposition to a, a verbal concept, you just intensified the meaning. So what's it significant about that? Paul says, hey, God's salvation plan in the Old Testament is so specific, so amazing, it's jaw-dropping. He says, if you're a skeptic searching for evidence, it's everywhere, specifically in the prophets. 
prophesied 700, 800, 900, 500 years before the fact with specificity. And we'll get into that in just a second. God promised beforehand this gospel message. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, it contains an ancient creed uh, that Paul memorized when he was a new believer. And he, and he weaves it into 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, and since the Pauline literature predated the, the gospel literature, etc., time-wise when they wrote it, they're theorizing 1 Corinthians was probably written around 58 uh, AD, uh, 59, uh, right around the new Neuronian uh, time before the Neuronian persecu- persecution began. Uh, but notice what he says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. He says, this is the creed that they memorized as Christians, not long after the death of Christ around 32, 33 AD. So around 58 AD, they already have this creed. What, what's the creed? For I deliver to you as first importance what I also received, what they gave me, what they give him, that Christ, Christos, died historically for what? Our sins, according to what? The scriptures. What scriptures? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the Old Testament. Talked about Jesus coming and dying for our sins. It's everywhere. I mean, you cannot read the Old Testament and not bump into Jesus. Have you read Genesis lately? I mean, you read the story of Joseph. I mean, it's just chapter after chapter after chapter. You read the story of Joseph. Okay, he, his, his brothers hated him. What did they do? They sold him into slavery to the Ishmaelites. They, they gave him up for dead and concocted a lie to their dad. And he's eventually picked up by the Ishmaelites and he's taken into Egypt and he's thrown into prison there for standing up for moral causes. And then he rises to being second in command of Egypt. And then God sends a famine to his land and his, his brothers come and don't even know who he is. And then he meets with them and eventually forgives his brothers, he, totally grace, when they had rejected him. He, I sat down one day with my uh, the tablet and began to write the, 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 the way Joseph's life reflects Christ's life. Point one, point two, point three, point four, point fifteen, point twenty, point thirty. I went on for page after page after page. You can see Jesus woven all throughout the Joseph story. Truly. See, Jesus' his whole ministry is woven throughout the Old Testament if you're paying attention. Just most people don't pay attention. But God planned this before, well, the world's word. Notice what Peter says. Second Peter chapter one, verse twenty. Here's what Peter, who walked with Christ, wrote his last letter. He says, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of what? One's own interpretation. Well, I kind of feel that. No, no. Uh, how do we get these prophecies? For no prophecy uh, was ever made by an act of human will, but notice the contrast. Man were moved by who? The Holy Spirit who spoke from God. How'd that work? Remember the Trinity? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which my Jehovah's Witness family denies. Um, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father tells the Spirit. I want to, this is what I want to communicate to the prophet Isaiah. Uh, I want to tell Micah what city my messianic son will be born in, chapter 5, verse 2. I'm going to, you're going to talk, the Spirit will talk to Micah. You will give this to him. He will write it down in his, in his own uh, language, with his own uh, flair, uh, but he will write down what I want him to do. So it's not atomistic like dictation, but he's giving them the concepts and the, the ideas, writing them down, and it's specific. And God gives that to us. And Peter says he, he did this. It was the spirit of God moving men of God. And, and, and it had to be men of God because no one could give those precise prophecies if God didn't give the information. It had to be. Because you can't specify the coming of the Messiah with specificity in it, city that he's born in, tribe that he's born to, who is, you know, et cetera, unless God knew the info seven, 800, 500 years before the fact. Jesus, after he was crucified, and his, his disciples were blown away, uh, despondent, as it were. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus reappears after his crucifixion, before he ascends into heaven. He runs into two disciples who are despondent over the fact that Jesus had been crucified. And he appears, fleshly, and he asks them a question. Hey, uh, what are those words that you were exchanging with one another as you were walking? Hey, what are you guys debating? What are you guys discussing? What are you guys upset about? Etc. Could you imagine? You were having a theological discussion with your husband and Jesus appears. What are you talking about again? You know, they're having this discussion. And he finds out that they're despondent over the fact, you know, that Jesus has been crucified, etc. And then he's going to verbally reprimand them. Notice what he says in verse 25. This is uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 25. He tells these two, non- these two uh, disciples, oh foolish man, <laughs> slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, from Genesis to Malachi, was it not necessary for the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah, the Messiah, to suffer these things and then to enter glory? 
haven't you guys read? And if you read, if you read uh, Luke 24, Jesus then began to talk to them as they walked on that western road toward Emmaus, uh, just outside of uh, uh, Jerusalem. I've been on that area many times on tours. Uh, he begins to educate them where he's seen in the Old Testament. Would that not be a Bible study you would like to be a part of? And it talks about how their, uh, how their hearts just burned within them when he's talking to them because he begins to connect the dots. You know, when God ever connects the spiritual dots in your life, it's exciting because he takes the Old Testament and he tells you, I'm written on every page of it, my plan. And it was all done through the holy writings. How specific was God? Very, very specific. In fact, there's 60 exact prophecies that he can't control that he fulfilled. 60. You should memorize a few of them. Because the person that, um, I, my, for my systematic philosophy class, we were studying David Hume. That was an exhilarating reading. Because most people at university uh, level believe that his thinking of how to argue against the existence of God and miracles and Christians is, is the definitive way to argue. Well, our class was how, how you deconstruct Hume. Well, you begin to look at the evidence. Well, what's the evidence? Well, think of the prophecies of Christ. Um, Isaiah 7, 14, he would be born of a virgin. Um... Micah chapter 5, verse 2. He's going to be born in what city? Bethlehem. Uh, Psalm chapter uh, 89, that he would be uh, of the line of David, Davidic king. Um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. His ministry would begin in Galilee. Uh, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. When they betrayed him, they would sell him for 30 pieces of silver. Isaiah 53, 13. He would be crucified between thieves. And on and on and on go the 60 that he cannot control. What's the statistical probability that Jesus fulfilled all 60? Impossible. See, the person who says, I need empirical evidence, you just don't want to look at the evidence God gave you because he gets in your face and says, I've given you enough information to believe that I am the God and Savior of all mankind. Now, I, I gave you some statistical evidence three weeks ago about God you know, fulfilling all these prophecies, and I want to look at it from a different perspective as we close. And I want to ask this simple question. Take the 60 prophecies, and let's just say 48 of them. What's the probability Christ could have fulfilled 48 prophecies he can't control? Can't control them. There's a book uh, uh, called Science Speaks uh, by a man named Peter Stoner, uh, and he breaks down the jaw-dropping figure of 48 prophecies fulfilled by Christ out of the 60 to be one chance in 10 to the 157th power. You're thinking, I hate math. What did he just say? Okay. Are you, what's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a whole lot. Any mathematicians here? What's the probability that one man, in one chance, in uh, 10 to the 157th power, is going to fulfill 48 prophecies? It cannot happen. It cannot. So he breaks it down to help us understand what that means. Just the 48 prophecies at 10 to the 157th power. Here's what he says in Science Speaks. I love this part here. This is a really large number. <laughs> a smiley face in the column. Yeah, right. It represents an extremely small chance. He says, let us try to visualize this. He says, the electron is about as small as object as we know of. It is so small that it will take, follow this, 2.5 times 10 to the 15th power, not 157, to lay them side by side in a single line uh, to make, you know, an inch long, okay? 10 to the 15th power to make an inch of electrons. It says, if we were going out to, to count the electrons in this line that were one inch long and counted 250 each minute, and we counted day and night, it would take us 19 million years to cover an inch. Hmm? That's 10 to the 15th power. Do you see where this is going? Where's it going? Forget about it. God gave you plenty of evidence. If 10 to the 15th power is, this is not going to happen. 10 to the 157th power What's, th what's this say? He then changes it. If we took a cubic inch of these electrons and we tried to count them, it would take us counting steadily 250 each minute, 19 million times 19 million times 19 million years, or 6.9 times 10 to the 21st amount of years. He says, now with this introduction, let us go back and change, uh, go back and look at our chance of 1 in 10 to the 157th power. He says, let us suppose that we are taking this number of electrons, marking uno, eins, one, I'm going to pick one out of the 10 to the 157th power. We're going we're gonna to mark it, he says, and we're going to thoroughly stir the whole mass of them together, and we're going to go get somebody and tell them, pick one. And they pick one out of billions on their first try. <laughs> You'd probably say, hey, something was rigged here. 
The point is you couldn't do it. He says that's the chance of Jesus fulfilling 48 prophecies, which is 10 to the 157th power. See, God says, I gave you enough to believe. In fact, God says, not, hey, I gave you more than 48. I gave you 60. You need evidence? I would say, what are you waiting for to believe in Christ? You have enough information. The problem, as I said before, is not informational. It's volitional. It's a heart. The heart's wicked. See, the, Jesus has the gospel to save the wicked heart and to take those per- people who desperately need to know him and show them the path to life. Paul says, I am all about that gospel. Here's the way I look at it. If you are so sold out to that gospel that has that kind of evidence, you should be talking about it all the time, looking for opportunity, even on a plane at 30,000 feet, right? Thinking, I don't need to catch some Z's. I need to catch a soul for God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to open the scriptures, to look at Paul's credentials. Thank you for saving a a man like him, uh, taking a man uh, so twisted and tainted by false theology and a wicked lifestyle of of killing Christians as a persecutor. Uh, You loved even him and redeemed him. Thank you for the fact that you redeem and save us and you have a plan for us. Might we pursue that plan individually, ask what you want us to do specifically. And for those among us who don't know you, uh, we know that you draw man to yourself. We pray you would draw them in such a way they will profoundly know that you have redeemed them in Christ's name. Amen. Have a great sunny day.